Okay, good afternoon and welcome back again, guys. Uh, I'm Tas Melissonos, Vice President and General Manager of the ANZ WSO2 team. And welcome to our afternoon fireside chat. I've just stoked the fire up and we're ready to, uh, to catch up with some of our friends and, and panelists across the region. Um, I'm pleased to, uh, to welcome, firstly, uh, Chinthi Wirasinga, the CEO of Mitra Innovation Solutions, a consulting and SR company across APAC and the UK. Hi, Chinthi. Hi, great to be here. Thanks, Des. We've also got Ian Richards, Managing Director of Integration Works, another consulting and SI company across Australia, New Zealand and the UK. Welcome, Ian, and, and thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tess, and thanks for the opportunity. No problem. And lastly but not least, we've got Craig Hayden. He's the Sales Director for Banking and Finance Solutions for Virtusa Australia, a global consulting and services company as we all know, I think originated uh, out of Sri Lanka, I believe, did Virtusa. So again, Craig, welcome to the to the panel and uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Tess, happy to be here. Wonderful. All right, as you guys already know from, from the uh, the event today, our, our theme for the summit has been a platform or platforms for innovation. And I'd like to sort of continue that, uh, that theme for our little, you know, chat and uh, question and answer session this afternoon. I've got a, a bunch of questions, three or four, that I, I'd like to ask you all each and get your thoughts and perspective on, on, uh, on some of these uh, questions or, or concerns that we're seeing in the market. So let me just get stuck into the first one. Um, now, the first one, we, in regards to challenges around innovating, We've seen across various industries and markets, and certainly you're working across several of, of those industries and markets, but we've also seen a lot of organisations not quite get it right, particularly around building the right culture and leveraging particularly the right technologies to create that effective innovation within a business. Um, I'll be interested to get your thoughts on what are you seeing out there about those challenges over the last you know, five, 10 years as they've been going through that journey of of innovation. So what I might do, I might start off with ladies first and, and, and throw to you, Chinti. What are sure. your thoughts? Sure, no, absolutely. I think that's a great question. And and I think, you know, I know this is for the APEC region, but I don't I, I don't believe believe the challenges are limited to the APEC region. Um, you know, in general, there are quite a few challenges when it comes to uh, digital transformation, digital innovation, starting with the, the fact that there's you know evolving customer needs. Uh, and, you know, we saw that through the pandemic, you know, we thought we had the customer needs sort of uh, determined, but then it changed, you know, and drastically. So uh, during the pandemic, um, the second thing is, I think, ineffective data management There's, you know, data is the new gold uh, and not being able to sort of manage that data and use that data to upsell, cross sell, leverage it to actually grow your business. I, I think that's what some of the second challenges. The third is inefficient business processes or the fact that people don't use this opportunity to really overhaul business processes. Uh, digital transformation is not just about digital uh, technology, right? It, it usually is confused um, because people think, okay, let's just put technology in and we should be, you know, we should be fine. It actually is an overhaul of business processes, overhaul of people, the skills. So uh, now, Coming to APAC, I think the biggest thing with APAC is it's it's pretty diverse. It's not like you know uh, you know the US or UK, which kind of can be sort of bugged in having a, a, the same perspective. Look at APAC, multitude of countries, multitude of cultures, multitude of experience, custom experience, uh, various levels of digital penetration, um, and in addition to that, I think some of the common challenges that I've seen is that there is a truly uh, not a great strategy, not always. Uh, there's a lot of trials and errors, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, uh, and like I said earlier, the missed opportunity to leverage uh, digital transformation to really improve your business model, right? Um, the second thing is the lack of skill, um, it, it dedicated, available in, in the, the relevant regions. Um, the third thing is really a challenge in change management. 
uh, getting everybody bought in, uh, aligned, agreed on a path. And you you might find, you know, sometimes uh, there are two to three apps in a bank of doing the same things or something slightly different, right? So it, it can get very, very confusing. And last but not least, I think um, they, there are budget constraints and concerns. So these are kind of some of the, the common themes that I'm seeing. Um, you know, there's big ambitions, but smaller budgets. And I think I, I would um, kind of want to expand that, you know, digital transformation is a great opportunity really to overhaul your business model and to really leapfrog an organization forward. So, you know, not seeing that opportunity, I, I think is also a challenge. I hope that helps, Des. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, uh, I think uh, you've highlighted a lot of challenges there. There was probably a lot to, I was... Uh, I was taking some notes, but, you know, you talked about weak strategies that customers are trying to develop. You know, the skill base is a little bit low, so changing and improving and moving to that new technology might not be easy for them because they don't have the skills. You know, change management, you know, they're not that good at doing that quite yet. They might need help, though, from, you know, companies like yours to help them do that. And, of course, budgets are being limited. And I think the pandemic has sort of caused all that, right? And, uh um, and slow things out, particularly in APAC. So I, I did notice you, you note you did say APAC, and probably APAC. We've been a little bit slower to recover from the pandemic, yeah, say compared to Europe and the Americas, where are sort of getting back to things a little bit quicker. We've been a little bit slow to react. We've been a little bit more conservative in our approach. Um, so we still haven't quite got out of it yet, have we? So you know, I, okay. I can see with that, as 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 identified some of those challenges that you you raised. Um, Ian, uh, in Australia, uh, probably part of those those problems are, probably exist here. But but your thoughts on where, where, did, where have you seen the challenges around Australia um, in 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 this you know building on and and uh, embracing digital innovation? Yeah, thanks, Taz, um, and thanks, Chintha. You covered a lot there. Um, <laughs> a lot of it was quite um, yeah quite uh, easy to identify. Um, with with ourselves, Taz, the the APAC market, and especially in Australia, um, I think focusing just on the last couple of years, uh, it's become actually far more receptive to integration um, compared to a few years um, previous. Uh, COVID has highlighted the need for us all to be able to work um, and trade remotely, uh, and hence the requirement for digitisation has rapidly become firmly established. Um, together with the remote working being forced upon a lot of us, the move to digital, digitalisation has greatly accelerated um, and our market in Australia has seen some rapid development because of this. Um, this has caught many industries by surprise, I believe, um, and where once there was time to respond and almost a wait and see um, view of things, uh, this luxury of time has, um, to invest has, has actually diminished. Um, and because of the time taken f over the COVID um, pandemic, um, there's been a lot of thought gone into the response uh, and potentially not a lot of action um, at the time because of the, um, the focus on the response to COVID. Um, so I guess the challenges we are seeing with this is that uh, whilst COVID has accelerated the need for digital digitalization, um, it's also held us back to some extent uh, where investment has uh, may may not have been for uh, well sorry where investment may have been forthcoming, um, a lot of our potential clients are now struggling with day to day business, uh, keeping the lights on, supply, resourcing, etc. And of course, resourcing has become quite a battleground um, yeah. with the ability to resource um, overseas um, taking a hit because of the pandemic as well. So that for those uh, of our clients that are ready to leap forward into the new digital world, um, the resourcing, the technology selection, um, organisational change is a huge one um, because that impacts you know, how, they, how they look forward to build teams, how they can resource those teams and how they can, how they can formulate their company to maximise their return on investment. Um, they're, they're all the challenges I see um, coming forward. And obviously, being integration experts, um, ourselves as well as Vatusa um, and Chinthi, we can all um, help our clients along the way with that. Yeah, look, at, indeed. But it's interesting you picked up on, the, I, I, like, I like your point about 
they they want to integrate or they want to transform, but they're being held back, right? Obviously, the pandemic has really set them back a bit because now their whole workforce, their partners are remote. So they're going to figure out a way, how do they continue being innovative or how do they continue to transform along that journey, but now do it remotely? So I think they're new learnings that everyone, every CIO, every CEO has to now face and figure out how to change the way they do business, right? How they, how they and how they innovate. So I think that was good, um, a good good point there you made there. So thank you, thank you, Ian, for, for, for that remark. Um, Craig, last but not least, as I said, uh, from a banking sector perspective, I know you and your team focuses a lot on the banking sector, particularly here in this region. Um, and we all know banking sometimes is in Australia particularly is known to be lag out a little bit and, and follow, but, but certainly um, digital uh, and new banks have emerged without the concern of legacy, you know, to worry about. So they've basically gone straight in with innovative new, you know, technologies, leveraging cloud, etc. And you've got sort of the new and the neo banks being able to do things quick and 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 and, and fast. But then you've also got those lagging behind, you know, that are trying to move from legacy to to the new brave new world. So what what have you seen across both, I suppose, uh, types of banks? Um, those challenges in 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 trying to to, to you know transform and change yeah it, it's interesting and it, it's the the comparison you draw is something that um, sometimes the banks themselves aren't aware of um, particularly the the kind of the bigger institutionalized banks that have been around for four decades a lot of them will consider themselves agile and consider themselves uh, quick quick to change until you show them case studies and stories and anecdotes from truly digital digital banks and they're flabbergasted by the, the pace of change that some of those banks are are able to achieve. Um, in, in terms of the, the challenges that we're seeing, and, um, and and particularly focusing on the on the point in your question around the, the culture, which is something that really kind of is, is a bit of a passion of mine. The the point that I think both Chinti and Ian touched upon about the resourcing is interesting. Um, it's a huge challenge for us at the moment. Um, and the second point is you know, adaptation to working from home. The, the amount of collaboration you do and how that's done through digital channels. Not always in a negative as people maybe first think. Um, for those of us that have been able to adapt quickly, I think there's huge opportunity from the collaborative tools out there. You know, we're a big user of Microsoft Teams, for example, um, and, and that actually, in some cases, allows us to be a lot more collaborative. Um, but it's a, it's a massive adaptation. So th those two challenges of, of resourcing and, and kind of the COVID impact um, also have a massive impact on the culture. Um, you know, you've got a lot of churn of resource. Um, you've got a constantly evolving culture. Um, the, there's people coming into an organization with very different views and they have to get up to the norms and the standards of that organization, which slows down change. You get, you know, the, the classic norming, storming phases. Um, we, we've seen a lot of impact of that. Um, a lot of knowledge lost through that attrition because like you say, there's such a closed market. Um, people are being offered more and more attractive salaries elsewhere so that attrition and rotation is ever increasing um, knowledge is walking out the bank and and those those banks that don't have really well established processes um, are finding that they are more impacted by that attrition you know they're more reliant on those people who have you know just got everything stored up in their head you know they know how things work and they're the go-to person um, so those those changes have, have really shown the banks that are mature and digitized um, and digitalized and ready to move forward and those who are a bit more archaic. Look, it's interesting, all three of you have got similar themes and that and, and our challenges tend to be, your challenges all tend to be around people, right? I've noticed, right? So skills, you know, changing, the ability to be receptive, to ability to transfer form, You've got a need, but you just can't deliver it. Obviously, working remotely, et cetera, and, of course, resources all seem to be very centred around around uh, people. So it may not be the technology. They may have all this great technology, but they just can't get the people together, get the strategy, get the culture. Uh, I know, Shinzi, you talked about get the business process right to change, and, and that is all evolves around people. So I, I suppose my, my next question, you know, evolves around that, that internal buying, right? So we all know that, you know, 
you know, various elements of effective digital transformation resolve around getting the, the people, the stakeholders to buy in on, on what you're trying to do. Um, so so I'd love to sort of know what you're seeing on, on, on these bottlenecks that you're seeing with clients around getting the whole organisation to buy in to transform. Obviously, you know, the pandemic is, has really put a big hurdle in the middle of that because now companies find it even hard to communicate amongst their teams. But but how are they trying to do that now in, in the middle of all this and get that stakeholder buy-in? I might start with Ian this time. Thanks, Tez. Um, good question. Um, and I guess it goes back um, to the previous, my answer to the previous question um, around that organisational change. Um, and internal buy-in is absolutely essential for uh, driving that organisational change because it does go out across more than just the IT section or the you know, different areas of the business. It is across the whole business. Um, and with the plethora of integration technologies and methodologies on hand, um, it's essential for clients to get good advice uh, and agree as to their integration roadmap because it will affect all areas of their, um, of their company. Um, so we, we utilize a standards-based approach um, to assist our clients, which looks across the organization, um, as we believe you know, that that's a criteria, um, or there's criteria across the organization um, and, and things such as identity and access management um, can be just as important as the business process design or the API throughput um, and or the governance processes. Uh, there, there's a lot to consider when you're looking at digital transformation right from the technology, but you start at the business level. Um, so the roadmap must support the business on, on the integration journey. And this requires ongoing buy-in from the senior stakeholders. Uh, so by including them in an initial discussions, um, the sponsorship of the digital transformation is more likely to be secured long term, uh, regardless of any change or organisational change, uh, personnel changes, etc. So the early discussions that we have allow us to scope uh, the, uh, the scope to broaden the conversation amongst the key stakeholder group um, and to include business drivers as well as the financial and technical drivers. No, good points. It's it's interesting about um, you know whether you're you know just transforming a process or or you are doing a a digital you know transformation program. It it is a top down you know step. You know you, you know the executives, the senior stakeholders, as you call them, Ian, have to sort of drive that change, right? Drive that that culture within the organisation. If if it's a bottom up, in other words, technology architecture only, uh, it's not it's not you know, owned by the business or owned by the executive, then it typically we find that it doesn't doesn't get anywhere, right? So, so uh, it's it's interesting that it's really got to be that culture, and it's got to be driven by the executive team, which you highlighted. So, uh, Chinti, I might throw to you uh, next if I if I can. Sure. Um, don't worry, Craig. We'll we'll get you first next time. Um, uh, I don't want you to keep coming coming uh, third every time. But, uh, but Chinti, your thoughts on that, that, that you know, executive buy-in or, or stakeholder buy-in, what are you seeing out there in terms of trying to, you know, get, get an organisation to truly believe top-down they need to transform in the right way? Absolutely. I think um, I think of this as a triad, um, as a stool almost that you have to balance. And, and, uh, and let me first tell you what the three things are. One is to identify who those stakeholders are. Um, two is have a very clear value proposition, benefit to each of those um, stakeholders clearly defined. Uh, three is have a strategy to demonstrate that. Now, when it, and it's very easy with, when it comes to integration and, and the tools that we have at hand because, and we use this very, very successful, uh, we actually demo the benefits to them, right? We, we would showcase them in an API and, and you know what they say, right? Um, it, you know, after an event, only 10% uh, of what people, 10% uh, of what people hear are retained, 35% of visual and 65% if you kind of marry the both together, right? So we use that very, very, uh, you know, uh, as a strategy to make sure that people are bought into the solution, they see the value. 
And, you know, a few and highlighting the benefits also is, you know, the simplicity of what we are uh, talking about is a great way to get the buy in. Right. It, it's not about putting a monolithic, uh, replacing a monolithic system. Right. It's uh, quick things that you can do to make sure you can take a step forward, achieve a quick win. Putting in an API that integrates uh, with some of these channels is, is a great way to showcase a quick win. And that's extremely important for to get buy-in of the entire process. So, and, and scale as you need it, right? So it's, again, do we have to do everything all at once? No, you can start with, you know, uh, the, the EI, you can start with API. You don't have to put everything together. It's just scaling it as, as it goes. So those are some of the key things that we do to one, you know, get people to understand the value, to make sure it, it's not this overwhelming process to transform. It's a step-by-step, -step, easy process that can take things forward. Um, so I, I think those are some of the tricks that we use, and we demo everything. Now we have platforms ready to demo for a bank, for a telco, um, so that people understand it. It's, it, it is really, um, and, and I think some of uh, your strategies around low code will also help. Yeah, make it simple. Right. Things yeah. Forward. yeah, look, uh, it, uh, I'm not saying that executives are simple-minded folks, right? No, but far, far from it. But but I do like the idea. Ian talked about methodologies to make it easy for them to understand and and, and get the buy-in. You talk about you know demo the benefits. You know, make it simple. Make them see yeah. why this transformation is going to improve their organization. You know, give them that competitive advantage. So so I like those techniques that you're seeing, but. Uh, there, uh, Craig. Uh, I mean, what are you seeing again? Banking finance world in Australia across across that market. You know, what what are you seeing on you know, struggles in getting you know people and and stakeholder buy in you know to to key projects? Yeah, do it. It's interesting um, hearing hearing the answers from from Chinthi and Ian, and um, and I thought about the question in a bit of a different way. I very much thought of this as from bottom up because the the buy in that I've struggled with in the past has been from um, kind of from the lower levels, um, I find a lot of our clients have at an exec level a very good idea of what they want to achieve, um, but actually getting a buy-in and adoption from those lower levels is, is where they find their, their challenge. And really the key to that, I think, Chintha, you touched upon looking at the importance and look at the benefit for each user group, um, and that's really important, and that really only happens by talking to those people. Um, so we we often at the start of our project will run what we call uh, an accelerated solution design workshop. So it's a fancy term, but it's just a prepare workshop. Um, and we make sure and we insist upon having representation from all those different groups because there's so much knowledge in some of those groups. And if, if you just tell someone that what's changing and if you just in, you know force a change upon them, you won't get the adoption of the buying that you need. And, and you know we've seen that come to life so many times. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we have a bit of a tool um, which is a, it really gamifies the coding process. Um, the tool itself isn't kind of that important, but it's important for the story. Um, it, it gamifies the coding process. Um, we have leaderboards. Um, people can see the work that they've done. They can compare themselves to their peers. Um, and we've got night and day examples of implementing that tool. Um, somewhere people on the ground have seen that as a way of observing them. It's big brother. They're checking what I'm doing. They're, they're judging me against my peers. Um, and it's got absolutely no buy-in. Uh, the project's tanked and, and, and been a complete failure. On the other side, when messaged correctly, when people are brought in, um, you know, involved in the whole process, people are seeing that as them being empowered. You know, this gamification and this identification of mistakes even, well, I, I can now see that I've made a mistake. And before my manager even knows or can tell me or before it becomes an issue in production, I, I fix my own mistake. Um, and the, the difference is astounding. I mean, it all comes from how it's, how it's communicated and, and how those how those sessions are run. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. I, I like your different approach. And, and I suppose being a consulting partner, all, all three of you are, are consulting, you know, you know, system integrator and consulting type type partners, you would tend to go top down. So you tend to get maybe stake, uh, senior stakeholder buy-in first. So maybe I can see where you're saying you're struggling or finding it difficult to get the top to, to, tell, to tell the technologists or the, or the, uh, the underlings, if you like, to, to adopt this new strategy. Uh, interesting, because being a vendor ourselves, being a technology company, we tend to go in from the bottom. So we tend to be able to convince technology is, is the key, but we then struggle to try to figure out how do we how do we take that message up to the business and provide and get that stakeholder buy-in. So 
this is probably why we partner with teams like you guys to help us do that, right? We understand the technology. We understand the enabling, you know, forces there to get, you know, to use the new technologies that are out there, AI or APIM or, you know, security. But we need to somehow get a message up to the business to say, leverage these technologies to help you be more innovative, to help you be uh, come up with new ideas and take those new ideas to market. So, look, uh, it, it, you know, you can see why we work with you guys so well, right? Is is that you need both bottom up and top down, you know, you know, buying to get uh, to get a project uh, along the way. So that's that's a that's a good take to that. I might stick with you, Craig, since I always tend to go to you last. So we'll give you a we'll give you a chance to to go first on the on, on the next one. And I, I'd like to take you to uh, to maybe a different angle since we've been talking about people and process. I'd like to take, get your thoughts, guys, on you know how do we how do we create that marriage and connection to the legacy systems and and the data that companies have uh, because we find that that what tends to hinder digital transformation you know most of the time that is right um, uh, I think it's a known fact you know however that some of, uh, some organisations I suppose are unable to move forward because of their legacy systems and it could be you know various factors but you know sometimes it's you know for them it's it's too hard to change you know the migration time takes too long so they, they don't want to go through that two three year process even though we all know you've got to you've got to adapt and change um sometimes it's people themselves we talked about that you know you're trying to change people or get people's buy-in but sometimes we all know people like to stick with what they had before so they don't want to adapt and adopt new ideas or or new processes or or new technologies. They're they're happy with you know coding in COBOL and running mainframe systems, for example, right? Uh, and, and sometimes even the investment might be too too large. I mean, Chinsi, you talked about budget, you know, is is getting smaller and smaller nowadays. And, and even maybe the problems there's other problems around. Well, we can't get support to make that change. So. So I'm curious uh, here, Craig, to, to let you go first here and get your take on this, right? How can we help organisations understand that legacy systems are only really holding them back and they need to be more agile and innovative, leverage some of the new technologies, maybe like APIs or API-first technologies to help them be more innovative, help them change faster. So what are your thoughts about that? That legacy world to new, 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 brave new world, you know, transition. Again, interesting. I uh, I only really found myself in technology over the last couple of years. So my background has been on, on the business side. Um, I remember having a fair few conversations in my first few months working with Fatusa with various clients and talking to them about all the amazing things we could do for them. Um, you know, all the transformation, um, all the new systems. And they would patiently sit there and listen to me. Um, and at the end, several different times, people would come to me and say, that's great. And I know it. You know, I know that we can be faster on the cloud. I know that by moving our data to Google, we can do more analytics. You know, you're not telling me anything new. The challenge is how. Uh, and it's those challenges you've talked about, Tash, you know, whether, whether it's people, time, investment, budget being a big one. Um, a lot of the time, budget has been the, the biggest blocker for us. Um, and it's, you know, you can show people on paper that these projects are self-funding. Yes. But it's that spiking cost. Okay, over the next two years, um, you know, all that transformation is going to cost me X for me to later make that back. Um, that's been the, the biggest challenge for us is how, how do the banks find that budget for that, for that cost? Um, and especially when some of the decision makers know that you know, they might not be in that same seat in two, three, four, five years time when the benefit comes. Um, so, you know, are they being rewarded on a personal basis? Again, getting back to the, the person behind it, on a personal basis, are they being rewarded for that change? Um, yeah. that, that's been the thing. And you know, there's different ways of, of looking at it. And there's, I've seen some really interesting in models. Um, one uh, co competitor of ours, um, I'm not ashamed to say, had a, <clears throat> had a particularly good model where they did free transformation. So they did a bunch of projects. They said, look, here's, here's some levers and pull. We'll, we'll do some free transformation and we'll take a percentage of the cost saving. Um, so again, innovative ways of looking at it, um, yeah. but understanding understanding what the issue is before you can then you know, ad address how you, how you do it. Right. If you understand the bottleneck and, it, and and maybe explain the benefit better, you know, and 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 the and the benefit of change, 
then maybe people might come along with you along that journey. Again, top down, uh, and if they believe that they, they can get there, they might go ahead and do it, right, rather than put up the hands and the brick walls and say, no, 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 all too hard. Um, yeah. And the benefit they know is there. Yeah. It's the how. Yeah. It's how, do we, how. how do we get to the end of the rainbow? No, no, great, great, uh, great, uh, great response. Ian, your thoughts on on that marriage of, of legacy and moving to the, the brave new world? What what are you seeing as, a, you know, the reason for, for the holdup from customers? Yeah, I think um, most companies that we're talking to uh, recently, Taz, um, are fairly open um, and knowledgeable enough uh, about digitalization uh, that they actually realize that their legacy systems are holding them back um, and and not slowing the progress of their business and you know, potentially um, putting them behind their competitors who have already taken the first steps on those journeys. Um, so the question, as you rightly ask, is, is how do they deal with this or how do we help them deal with this? Um, we've got a couple of, um, of, I wouldn't say options, a couple of uh, ways that we deal with it, but it is very, very dependent on the, on the actual situation of the client. Um, for instance, if the, uh, the, the client has data that's actually locked away in the back-end systems and they can't get to it, such as if they have it locked away in a PIC database, um, such as uh, the mutual banks and credit unions are, are great for this, as well as uh, local government, et cetera. Um, we've actually created a solution that allows them to free that data up and then push that through um, for use in the in the front end systems. Um, alternatively, we find that a two speed transformation um, roadmap is often very successful, um, especially if the company is spearheading their transformation push with the likes of a new CRM or ERP system. So we're able to use the integration platform to de-risk the initial project. Um, where we integrate the old legacy applications into the um, into the platform, and then we can provide the uh, the, the data in the formats, etc., that the ERP CRM, the more modern application, requires it. Um, and then we can take those backend systems and the services that they provide, and we can then gradually replace those services um, in a reduced risk method of taking the next tele technological step forwards. Right. Um, and that allows them to pull gradually away from those legacy systems, always using that front end, um, as that, as that new, um, gateway to the, uh, to their, to their clients and customers. Is it always a gradual step, Ian? I mean, it's a good point you raised there about, about you know, slowly bringing in the new technology and, and slowly phasing out the old. Is it typically a, a phase slow approach or are we, are we seeing customers do big bang like they used to, you know, 10, 15 years ago? Or is that gone, the big bang approach, and it's now slow, slow, steady journey to transform? Well, I guess, Taz, when I say slow, um, slow and fast are two, uh, two terms that, are, um, that can, can mean different things to different people. <laughs> yes. it, it doesn't mean it's over a number of years, but certainly the benef one of the big benefits of an integration platform is it can de-risk that big bang approach. Um, so, yes, when we've talked to people, they've been far, because systems are far more complex today than they were maybe six years ago, ten years ago. Um, so putting in a big bang approach when it was a client server is completely different to putting in a big bang approach where you're integrating a whole raft of, of back end systems yeah. um, into a new front end. So generally, yeah. we do find that um, although it may be continuous projects and continuous delivery, the initial project is delivered before uh, we start to move too much on the back end. And the, Interesting. And those yeah, systems. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, Chinti, um, uh, your thoughts, uh, what you're seeing with your customers, you know, around APAC, uh, UK, um, you know, what what are they struggling with in, you know, letting go of the of the legacy and moving moving to the to the new new technologies? Or what what are, what are you seeing as their biggest uh, concerns? Sorry, um, yeah. So I think you know our approach to uh, legacy. I, I I agree with Ian. I think uh, people want to. 
it's it's a risk averse approach right it's it's i think that's what ian meant by being slow it's all relative right slow today is is probably a few months versus what it was before and a great way to you know accelerate and give them value is you know um through our integration services because it it is what it is is a great piece of software that sits in the middle a great architecture that sort of de-risks some of that but also showcases progress and i think how we encourage it really to say start with your integration because it can you know it can take a while to sort of replace your legacy systems and move away from it but you have a easy way of swapping out let's say your uh, channels as well as your you know your back end systems when you put put the integration uh, system in <clears throat> and you know it's cloud based like i talked about it you know you can scale to uh, uh, at the at the pace you want at the level you want you know think about this region being very cost sensitive uh, these are also great ways to sort of move uh, organizations forward. But, you know, what people don't see, I feel, is, you know, your, that ability to really also look at the convergence market. Now it's not just about you communicating or inter, in, the interoperability between you and your customers, your communication with your customers and the, the data that you collect through that. It's also about doing business, the B2B integrations, that convergence market that takes you, uh, evolves your business uh, to give you the, the, the next step. I, I'll speak to you about, um, uh, without naming names, a, a, a customer. Uh, it was a railway in, in Australia that we were um, speaking to them about you know, the importance of putting integration in and how their biggest competition was not the other, another, the, the railroad. It was actually Ubers of the world, the taxi that does it end to end, right? So how do you make sure your experience is equal to that experience of, you know, taking a person from one point to the other and how do you make it convenient? And now that was all about, you know, leveraging uh, integration converging with other businesses and actually delivering, being able to deliver that service. They weren't ready to give up all their legacy systems or move away from that. In fact, that was, you know, they needed all of that, but they could still leapfrog, get to a new business model completely because of uh, of an integration. I think that's a great way to sort of see some quick wins as well, Tess. Thank you. No, you're right. You're right. Look, it's been an interesting discussion this afternoon, guys.